10, and bam. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for Friends University's first ever Black Artist Series. I am Sheldon Mba, the director of the music theater program here at Friends, and through collaboration with Friends Dance and the Multicultural Department, we are able to gift you with this special treat in honor of Black History Month. This series exposes students and the Wichita community to the intersectionality of African Americans and the arts, challenging them to appreciate the cultural differences and revel in the similarity. Through a series of guest lectures like today, master classes and workshops, the Wichita community will gain an understanding of how African Americans express their art and also be able to walk away with, the, with new methods and apply the newfound knowledge to their own craft. Today, we have Deja M. Rice, okay? And I'm gonna read you guys a little bit about who she is because you need to get into it, period. So originally from Spring Valley, New York, Deja is a performing and teaching artist and author. She obtained her Bachelor of Arts degree in theater performance and education from North Carolina Central University. Deja has spent most of her career, <laughs> Eagle Pride, <laughs> has spent most of her career performing on the stage and enhancing the personal, professional, and artistic development of youth through the performing arts. Now residing in Grayson, Georgia, she is currently pursuing her MFA in acting at the University of Georgia. Deja is, and let me add that she's about to walk away with all of those letters in like less than like four months, okay? <laughs> um, now I lost my spot. Da -da 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 -da. Deja is the co-founder and artistic director of the Rice's Family Enterprises, which is an umbrella company that houses the multifaceted brand of Deja and her husband, Jonathan Rice. Their mission is to be a light in darkness and help others develop their own light illuminating the world with sophisticated, soulful, and spiritual content through, through their marriage, art, and ministry. Deja leverages her platform and influence as an artist and entrepreneur to encourage and inspire others. She is the founder of the Daddy's Girl Movement, a published author of the book, Daddy's Girl, From Heartbreak to Redemption, and the creator and producer of the documentary film, Daddy's Girl Redefined. You can find more information at www.dejamrice.com, IG Deja M. Rice, all that jazz, okay? Oh my gosh. So before we get into our crafting your career, because even hearing Deja's um, talk, like bio, it's kind of like, oh, you started in theater, you're in producing, you're, you're writing books, hold on, how did you know you were gonna get there, yeah? Before we get into that, some quick housekeeping rules, yeah? Um, we encourage everyone to always have their camera on, but we completely understand. It's just nice to see faces, but um, make sure that your, video, your audio is off. Yeah, we don't need any feedback or any extra sound. Um, at any point, if you have any questions for Deja as we're going through this, please type them in the chat, or if there's a moment that we stop and we can accept questions, we'll let that be known. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Deja. This is gonna be a uh, interview conversation, conversation type of approach of things. So really laid back, really informal, but um, we are happy to get things started. Let me go ahead and pin you so they know who to go to. Okay, awesome. Deja, anything I missed to, to, to speak about you about? No, no, you hyped me up really well, friend. <laughs> I was like, hype me up, bro. That's right. <laughs> oh, I love that. So biggest thing that I think would be a great place to start is, all right, you're an undergrad. Can you mm -hmm. talk about your story from how you had this interest with performing and how that led you through to pursue it as an educational, as an academic endeavor, and then mm -hmm. going professionally. And then just like an overview about that would be really great to start us off. Yeah, I know. I, I hate saying it this way because it seems so cheesy when people say stuff like this, um, disclaimer. But um, I really feel like theater saved my life. <laughs> Um, and the reason why is because before I went to North Carolina Central University, 
to pursue my Bachelor of Art in theater, I was bumming it, y'all. Like, <laughs> I was sleeping on my grandmother's couch. I didn't have a job. I was just, you know, living off pipe dreams. But finally, I woke up and said, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bumming it. And I want to do something more with my life because I can do more. Um, and so my mom, she was living in North Carolina at the time. I um, had moved back to New York. I didn't live in New York all my life, but by this time I had moved back to New York. Um, and I auditioned for AMDA, the American Musical and Dramatic Academy in New York, um, what some people call SCAMDA, but Maybe I shouldn't say that on video. <laughs> Edit that part out. Um, <laughs> but um, so I got into that uh, program and then I wasn't able to afford to actually go. I wasn't able to afford to go to the New York um, Conservatory or the LA um, bachelor's program. So I said, I got to do something because now I've had this revelation, right? Like I am more, I can do more, I need to do more. So I said, well, my mom lives in North Carolina. Let me see what programs they have in North Carolina. And I applied to many, but North Carolina Central University got back to me. I did some research and saw that their theater department, though small, was doing amazing things. And so I decided to go there. And when I say it is one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life, because it reminded me of my active purpose. And when I mean, what I mean by active purpose is that I always knew I wanted to be a performing artist. I grew up singing, I've sang all my life, um, but going to school and being put in, within this structure and within this frame of you not only dream about producing, you not only dream about performing, but you are a performer. Day in, day out, you show up and you perform. It really forced me to become active in my purpose um, and active with a very clear um, focus, active with a very clear goal. And so, yeah, um, one of the best decisions I ever made in my life was to go to school for theater. And I think um, the biggest thing, could you touch a little bit more and you talked about, okay, so we always talk about like money shouldn't be an option when it comes to dreams and whatnot. So like we don't do AMDA, but we end up going to this small knit university. Mm -hmm. And can we talk about that experience? Because it's a little similar to how we are at Friends as in like our department's small, mm -hmm. tight knit. It almost feels as if, okay, does anyone even notice what we do over here? Oh. Are we even gaining anything from being in these small places? Yeah, we can, look, and we can go back and forth because I know we got stories. But. Yeah, we got stories. <laughs> but one thing I will say is I'm going to start with the obvious, right? When you are a small theater department, um, you have a lot of things working against you. Um, number one, you're not large in number. Um, number two, you um, are in the performing arts, which doesn't get as much respect as other programs. Um, and then for me and Sheldon, um, or sorry, Mr. Emba, <laughs> Professor Emba, um, for us, we were at an HBCU, which if any of you don't know, that's a historically black college or university. And so at an HBCU, not only were we a small department, small in number, so we weren't, you know, so it was so it was understood that people didn't notice us as quickly as maybe the law program or um, more of the athletic, you know, tracks that they had there. We were um, also a all black and all black program, so a predominantly black program. So that was working against us as well because historically black college universities already don't get a lot of funding and to take that funding and put it into the arts is almost financial suicide is the way they look at it. <laughs> um, because people don't look at the arts as a sure thing. So that's what you guys have working against you is that people don't look at the arts as lucrative. So they don't, they're not as quickly to invest in the arts. However, here's the good things that you have working for you. 
Um, you are small in numbers. There is so much opportunity for leadership. There is so much opportunity for in your little small net for you to be seen. You will get more performance time. I know that's one of the things that I really took advantage of being in a small department is that I didn't have a lot of competition. <laughs> um, and although there were others there, um, I think uh, Professor Ember will agree with me when I say that I presented myself as someone who wanted to work and my professors let me. Um, and they found not only a talented artist in me, but a dependable artist in me, and they put me to work. Um, and when I wasn't on the stage, I found community theater programs that I could be a part of. And that's another thing of being a part of a small um, educational institution. They're normally pretty rooted in the community. Um, and if not, that's something that you as students can start to try to implement and, and try to expand within your department, right? But our department was pretty well rooted in the community. And so all of the community theaters knew about NCCU theater. And I was able to go to those places and say, hey, I'm a student from NCCU and I want to get some outside work experience. And those people, those people put me to work. But not only that, because I presented myself as a presentable artist, not only did they put me to work within the department, but when traveling opportunities came up, when um, touring opportunities came up, we got to travel abroad. My name was one of the first names to get thrown in the hat because there's not a lot of competition around me. So I have a chance to really, really just allow myself to shine. I didn't have to fight anybody for it. All I had to do was just show up <laughs> and, and, and show up as my best self um, every time. And all of these opportunities that at a bigger university, a larger university that you probably would have to, you know, fight and scratch for, I didn't have to. And I'd like to think it was, it was because of the size of our department, the, you know, it kind of being smaller, but it also was the favor of God. <laughs> it also was the favor of God to come from feeling like I was, you know, quote unquote, bumming it and not doing anything to get thrown into this department. And I ended up doing everything, everything. And um, it was just a real blessing. But not only was I afforded that opportunity, I seized it. And so, yeah, that's what I'll say about that. Yeah. Okay. Really. Good. We haven't like we've we've talked about this like a couple of times, but we haven't like <laughs> hit on it recently. And every time, um, you know, we chat about the the background, it's um more things are revealed to me about like how prepared you know me taking advantage of everything, you know, in these programs, um, how beneficial it was for me. I wonder. So you said you've done a lot of things. Now I feel like Oprah. You know. Now you said you've done a lot of things. Now, what are some of the things that you would say were pivotal moments for you in your career as an undergraduate student that led you to the next step, which would be, and we'll get into like when you got handed the diploma or your first um, professional job outside of school and whatnot. Yes. Yeah, so um, once again, being a part of a, and I noticed that I never really greeted y'all. I just started talking, probably was my nerves. So let me stop and say, hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to be in your space. Thank you for allowing me to share your platform. I'm so grateful. Um, and so now I'm going to do my job. Okay. <laughs> I was like, Deja, you didn't say hi. Hi, guys. All right. Um, that just broke the ice. I just kind of like let go a little bit. All right. So um, what did you ask me? <laughs> No, I'm getting I'm getting that brain. It's like actor brain on top of creeping into middle age brain. So help me. <laughs> um, basically, I um, I was addressing. So what were the pivotal like among the many things that you've done? What mm -hmm. were some of the standout moments that of the things that you've accomplished or things you've got you? Yeah. Got you. All right. So. In undergrad, like I said, because we didn't get a lot of funding um, from the university 
and we had to pretty much raise a lot of money or go knocking on doors and begging for a lot of money. Um, we didn't have all of the funding that we needed to produce um, like the really big shows, you know? Um, so a lot of times we would produce um, shows that weren't as well known, but then my favorite part was when we got to produce shows that were new written works. Um, and who were those works written by? Sometimes they would be written by the professors and sometimes they would be written by us. <laughs> so, um, so we got a lot of experience with devising work. Um, and we didn't, and we didn't even know what devised work was back then. We, we was just trying to make theater. <laughs> We was, just, we was just trying to, we was just trying to, you know, put ourselves, you know, to work, you know, we didn't know what devising was, but that's what we were doing. We were devising and um, not only did we get to devise work, but like I said, we got to write work. So I have a really cool story. This is one of the most pivotal moments in my undergraduate career. So I'm in my acting three class and is it acting three or acting two? I think it was acting three. It was, acting it was three. the last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, acting three. And we all had to either learn 12 monologues and present them, or we had to uh, like back to back to back, or we could come up with like this one, like this little, um, perf we could write a performance, come up with a performance, right? And um, your girl was working two jobs, doing her student teaching, because I was double concentrating in, in, in education and I was still trying to get on stage when I could. So I was wiped. I was, I was wiped and I procrastinated and it was the week that we were supposed to present like maybe two days before we were supposed to present. And I looked at my friends, Sheldon and Jonathan and said, y'all, I have not started on my project. <laughs> I literally had not started. Like I had not put, I had not, you know, prepared any monologues. I had not written anything. I had not done anything. And, um, but I also have an affinity for jazz music, particularly smooth jazz music, but I like some classical jazz as well. And I am very familiar with the music and life story of Ella Fitzgerald. So y'all, I pulled together some MP3s, some instrumentals from Ella's, you know, book of songs, a catalog of songs. And I got up in front of the class and sang Ella Fitzgerald songs and told her life story. And the chair of our department loved it so much <laughs> that she helped me turn it into an official script and made it a produced show on the main stage. But not only that, not only did they produce it on the main stage, but then we went and toured it to another location um, around the city. And when I tell you, it was, it all, it, for one, it taught me, Deja, stop procrastinating, get that, get that together, girl. But then the other part of that was that, wow, like you really can, do this. You are not only an artist. Being here at NCCU has not only taught you how to execute other people's plans and actualize other people's visions, but you are a visionary. And that was a really um, integral part of who I would become as, yeah, it's crazy. It's Crazy, but cool, yes. Um, it's very integral part of who I would become as an artist because it was in that moment, it was like a nice culmination of all the things that they had been instilling in us all along. It's like, wow, I, I know how to make art. I am a visionary. I'm not just a talking head on stage that somebody's pulling the strings for behind the scenes. You know, I am someone who can plan and execute and actualize these things. And 
that was really important for me. And then the other part of what I really um, appreciate from NCCU was traveling abroad, going to Florence, Italy, and we were able to write, uh, devise a piece out there and perform it for the for the um, Firenze locals. And it was just a beautiful experience. We were out there for one month and it was just an amazing experience. We were out there looking for hip hop in Italy. Ask us how that went. Um, <laughs> But when we saw that we weren't going to find it, we, we, uh, we, you know, put something together and presented it to them. And that was a really fun experience. Oh, gosh, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> the idea of when you say how these small programs can make visionaries, you know, yeah. that can can bring the visionary to life. That's that's really powerful. If you're taking notes, please write that one down. Yeah. Or like jot it in your, in your mind. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. you know, cause a lot of, um, a lot of programs, they always look for like product. They're always looking for something mm -hmm. like put together, but in these smaller programs, like we can really get in and mm -hmm. fine tune things. Like I mm -hmm. remember, um, trying to do a monologue for Shabby was scary because it was so hard to get a, is this good? Yeah. It was like, she had time. <laughs> you know, these these larger universities they don't it seems like they really don't have time to kind of pick you apart yeah. <laughs> but um our mentor dr shabi in this small setting she had time to pick us apart sometimes tear us down build us back up again <laughs> she she had time you know how people say like oh i got time today she always had time <laughs> because there wasn't a lot of us. And so she always had time. And so, yeah, I love that, um, Sheldon. We didn't focus as much on product as we focused on process. And so I know I'm kind of jumping ahead, but just to show you how it all connects. So you skip ahead years and years later and we're in a pandemic. And artists are feeling defeated and they're feeling discouraged because they feel like they can't make art. And you have a group of people who have come out of, you know, this training where they're constantly affirming your process. And they give you applause for your product, but they're constantly, you know, helping you build your process and affirm you in your process. And when you come into a pandemic, and somebody tells you, oh, you can't make art, you laugh at that. What? <laughs> it doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I am who I am. My process doesn't stop just because I'm not able to stand up in front of thousands of people. My process doesn't stop just because I'm not working on a multi-million dollar movie. My process doesn't stop just because I can't get in the classroom physically with my students. My process does not stop. And that's a lesson that I learned way back then. <laughs> that's what was being instilled in me way back then. Why? Because we were in a small setting and they saw us and they had time to really, really work with us. Yeah. No, no good stuff. So now like my question is, since we're like looking ahead, so that's like the preparation that you got. What mm -hmm. was the first step? Because... I recall that it was always about, okay, got to audition, what's next? I got to book a job, any job, hire me, you know? So how did we start discovering, maybe not even um, consciously, but subconsciously that we are these visionaries in these mm -hmm. programs, that we we are not just strings. I like, I love that analogy, just being controlled by other people. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we take that and then get ready to graduate and then get ready to enter the workforce as a performing artist? You have your plans and you have your ideas about what you would like to do, but you leave room for surprises. You leave room for, for me, you leave room for God to surprise you. Um, when I was getting ready to graduate from undergrad, I was stressed out. <laughs> I remember I was working with a beautiful, beautiful man. Um, he is such a pillar in the Durham, North Carolina community, Mr. Wendell Tab. He was um, the person who um, allowed me to come into his classroom 
and um, do my student teaching with him. And I remember one day we were sitting at the, we were sitting at one of his desks in his classroom and he asked me how I was doing. And I just started bawling. I just started crying and saying, Mr. Tab, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know. I just feel like I've worked so hard to get to this point and now I have no idea what I'm gonna do. And I remember him just, you know, building me up and telling me, don't worry, like you're talented, something is gonna come along. Don't put so much pressure on yourself, but you couldn't tell me that then. <laughs> so I ended up getting a position that I had not even thought about. It was, y'all, when I tell you, it was nowhere on my radar. It was not in my journal. I ended up getting a job as a touring actor and director in a children's theater um, show for the Missoula Children's Theater. And the journey was hard. It was a challenging journey because I had never spent that much time away from my family. And I was most of the time the only black person in the room. And sometimes I swear by it, I was the only black person in town. So it was a hard experience. However, it was rewarding. I got to see places that most people in this nation probably have never even heard of. I'm talking about population of 93. And you're going into this small town and you ask a little girl, well, what do y'all do for fun here? And she looks you in the eye and she says, we wait for you. That was the most gratifying, um, humbling, and rewarding experience. Now, when I look at it, when I was in it, I was, I was, I was going crazy. But now that I look back on it, that's what leaving room for God to surprise me did for me. So that when I would go to a graduate program and I am the only black person in my cohort, oh, I was ready. I was ready because I had already been through a similar experience, probably a worse one. <laughs> You know, if it's a matter between good and bad, it was a worse experience, but that's what, yeah, that's what, that's what I, that's what I had to do at the end of my undergraduate experience. It's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to leave room for God to surprise me back then, but it's what I had to do because I didn't have the answers. I was putting myself out there and I was either getting nothing or no's. And then God presented me with something that I hadn't even thought about right? That my ears hadn't heard, that my eyes hadn't seen, you know? And so, yeah, just leaving room for God to surprise me. And even now, um, I'm a little older, I'm a little wiser, but I always remember that. Girl, just, you've, you've been here before. That's what I'm telling myself now. I'm getting ready to graduate from my graduate program in May, and things are looking a little blurry again, but I'm like, girl, you've been here before. <laughs> Leave room for God to make up the difference. Do what you can, let God make up the difference. That's it. No, that's that's good stuff. Because again, like, wait, I want to know exactly what's the next thing. I want to know, I want to know, I want to know. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you phrased it beautifully, this idea of, sure, make your plans. Sure, have your goals and everything. But leave space, you know, leave space for God. Because it's one of the things of like, you know, um, taking it from this process of like, we're artists, you know, we have control over our life to realize that it's like, we have a little control. <laughs> just a little bit. Just a little bit, just a little <laughs> bit. But what we do have control over is that perspective and is that work ethic that we have when we do have that. Um, yeah. you and you just have life. to, you just have to be consistent with putting that out there, putting your best foot forward and trusting that what is for you is gonna be yours. It's already yours. It is already written. The things that are concerning you, I, I've just been um, kind of, you know, building myself up on my, on my most holy faith. You know, I've been reminding myself that what is concerning me has already concerned God. Oh. It's already been written. He's already thought about it. He's already thought it through. Literally, what is supposed to be yours is already yours. So yes, of course, 
make your plans visionary, write it down, make it plain, you know, do all the things, but leave room for God to do those things that you have not thought about. Because his ways are not our ways, they're higher. His thoughts are not our thoughts, they're higher. And so what's for you is coming. And I'm, I'm even encouraging myself right now. But what's coming, but what's for you is yours. And you about to walk into it with it. Don't stress about it. Yeah. No, no, that's, <laughs> it's always that good reminder to have. That's good stuff. I'm like, <laughs> I'm feeling empowered and encouraged too right now. And, and now I, I want to like, so all of this happens. So what made us, not us, I always say us and we in like the it's classroom. It's us, it's us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I guess more specifically in this big chain of link, what made your link, what made you um, want to go into producing and and writing and and like directing and outside of the standard of how we might envision ourselves in undergrad of like, oh, I'm gonna be on tour. Like I'll see Deja going by this way um, and into the woods being the bomb, bomb witch. I'm over here gonna be tapping on 42nd street. We're gonna be passing. We're in completely different spots now. So yeah. like, I wanted to know what was your journey to writing the book, to um, producing, to mm -hmm. directing? Um, so everything I do is purpose driven. At least I try to make sure it is. Um, and how, the best way I can explain that is how God explained it to me over the pandemic is that I am a child of God first and everything I do flows from that, not the other way around. So I don't shape my career and I don't pursue my career based on the standards and based on the blueprint that the world tells me I should base it on. Um, and when I mean the world, I'm not talking about like the world versus the church. I'm just talking about the literal world, <laughs> the way that things have kind of been, you know, um, laid out for us in this industry. This idea that you got to take anything. Absolutely not. Mm -mm, no. Um, number one is that I live by Christ principles and everything that they have on TV is not a good reflection of that. So it's a no for me. Um, and I felt comfortable saying no to things, even when I was just starting and people looked at me like I was crazy because they said, you are too arrogant. Like you shouldn't say no to anything. You should be willing to take anything, but they don't walk in the same faith that I walk in. See, they think that if they say no to man, that that's the end of their destiny. And because I'm a child of God, I know differently. <laughs> I know that even if I say no to you there's still somebody who God has ordained to say yes to me. So it's a no for me. So my no has been strong. Um, but also going into producing, it was really because I wasn't getting as many yeses as I wanted. But I knew that that wasn't the end of my destiny. I started to pull on what else I could do. And I realized that, yeah, you're not only someone who can execute other people's visions, um, but you are a visionary. So whatever it is that you want to do, do it. God, God told me to make a documentary film about women being healed through Jesus Christ. I did it. I did it. You know, and, and, it, and it felt crazy in the moment because I had never made a film. I knew next to nothing about making a film when I did it, but I didn't have as much experience with filmmaking then as I do now, but I did it <laughs> not knowing that it would become something that I was really passionate about and loved. Um, you asked about me writing the book. I wrote the book because God told me to tell people about how I was healed from past traumas in my childhood. Literally, like I got married. I was reflecting on 
you know, the amazing night that I had with all of my family and my father, who I used to have a very strained relationship with. And God told me, okay, now that you've rejoiced about it, testify about it. And he told me to write a book. And then he told me, after you write the book, make a film. And then after you make the film, take it on tour. And after you take that on tour, I got another project for you to work on. And now I have become this filmmaker producer just because of purpose, just because I've been walking in purpose. I did not plan this. <laughs> this is not what I had planned. If you would have asked me six, seven years ago, I would have told you, oh, I'm going to be on Broadway and, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever they say we supposed to be doing. But I left room for God to surprise me. And my God, he did. <laughs> And continues to. <laughs> Back to that leave in space. Yeah, no, most definitely. And I guess I wonder, so since you brought that up, how has a balancing, because this is something that I, I make sure that I try to preach in my class about, um, uh, you know, this whole movement with intimacy directing in terms of like boundaries, morals, consent. How do we vocalize this? How do we do that? Um, but not then how do we still work and not be seen or deemed as difficult? Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to know how has your process been with um, balancing your faith and then mm -hmm. working with like secular pieces or in secular environments because um, there, while there are Christian you know, companies and institutions, there's not a lot of them and they're few and far between. And we get most of our ministry when we're doing shows like you know, Hamlet or shows like um, Raising in the Sun. I'm thinking about shows that we've done. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, I have been looked at as difficult before. Let me start there. Um, because one of the most recent times was when I went to graduate school. They had selected the cohort um, after they had to select the, they had selected the cohort after they had already selected the season and they did not select the cohort with the season with that current season in mind so they see a black girl and they think oh okay yeah she'll do in the blood <laughs> <laughs> no oh. and little did they know they was getting <laughs> they was getting danger <laughs> And I was not going to do some of the things that Hester has to do on stage. Um, so uh, I, I was looked at as difficult during that time. I had to explain to people that, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to say that. No, I'm not going to present myself that way on stage. And when they asked me why, it was like, because I don't want to. <laughs> and you can't make me. <laughs> um. But how do I balance that? Because that those moments have been very, very few and far between. I'm not looked at as difficult often. That was just an extreme case where if any of you know the show In the Blood, she has to do some really graphic things on stage. I'll leave it at that. And um, it, it, look, let's go back. It was a no for me. Um, but the way I see it is if it is going to not compromise my Christian aesthetic, but if it is going to compromise my boundaries and my morals as a Christian, it's a no. But not the aesthetic, not the aesthetic. It's more about the morality and the boundaries for me the spiritual boundaries for me. So just recently I did The Mountaintop. And if any of you know the show, The Mountaintop, she is, that mouth is lethal. She is dropping F-bombs. She is, I mean, she is going for it. But, and, and I'll be honest, I battled with it <laughs> because for so long I had said, I don't accept roles that have a lot of profanity or vulgarity. Like I don't accept those roles, but something kept pulling me to that role. And what I found was that my desire to tell that story in this climate, in this racial and social climate of America, it far exceeded my desire to protect 
my image as a Christian woman. I found ministry in the role. Um, just finished writing my thesis paper on it. So yes, I found ministry in the role and I leaned on that. I led with that. And when I realized that I could find ministry in even a role that I felt like was grotesque and a little risque, I just held on to that throughout the whole process. And that was my focus. Um, but that doesn't mean that once they yelled cut for the last time and said, that's a wrap, that doesn't mean that I'm gonna go home and start, you know, doing all the things that Kame did. <laughs> I mean, no. <laughs> and if somebody was to present me with that role at a different time in my life, it might, it might be a no, I don't know, but it's, I just really feel like you should be spirit led in everything you do lead with purpose. If you feel purpose for you to do something, if you feel spirit led to, to do something, do it. But if you feel like you're just doing something because there's people chattering in your ear saying, oh, you should be doing this. Don't don't do it. Don't do anything for anybody else. Do it because you are at peace with it within yourself. I think what you when you mentioned the, the Christian aesthetic, that is something that is so extremely powerful because mm -hmm. I know, um, and I'm not speaking on um, anybody, but I can only imagine, um, you know, at a private Christian university institute, there's this thing called image, you know, like there are certain things that we can produce, certain things that we can't produce, no matter how much of a case we try to build it just because mm -hmm. of that type of aesthetic, which is, you know, which is the nature of the thing. Um, but to know that even as a Christian artist, that like the aesthetic and your morals, mm -hmm. something different. Oh, um, <laughs> I want to, I want to, can I answer, yeah. can I answer that? Yeah. The Christian aesthetic, what I'm talking about when I say the Christian aesthetic is how you are seen, how people see you when they look at you, how you sound, how you move, how you physically appear, how you look, what do people see when they see you? That's what I'm talking about when I see the Christian aesthetic. So if you go to, you know, a Church of God in Christ conference, you might see a lot of big hats. Oh, some, uh, so we got somebody that's Kojic in the room. Um, you might see a lot of big hats and long flared out skirts and, and they're bedazzled and they're bejeweled and they're just, you know, all fabulous and, and, you know, stepping out for the Lord. But then if you go to a Baptist church, you might see people in t-shirts and jeans and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you just might, or just a simple button up and some slacks. You might see it a little that that is that is what I call the Christian aesthetic and I was getting ready to turn down a role because I didn't want people to see me outside of that role but still see that role but still see me as someone who was cursing and smoking and possibly you know too sexually driven I didn't want people to see that when they saw Deja so I had to first find what the role was beneath all of that, beneath her saying bad words, bad words, beneath her saying, you know, beneath her, you know, drinking, beneath her smoking, beneath her, you know, um, being a person who was a little sensual, beneath all of that, who is this character? And what does the world at large need from her and her world and then what does this character need from Deja? Remember, I'm, I'm an artist, but I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to minister through my art. So what does this character need from me? And once I identified those things, I was able to be at peace with performing that role because I stopped looking at this character doesn't match my aesthetic. It doesn't matter what I look like. I ain't supposed to look like me anyway. I'm an actor, <laughs> but... If I could find purpose in me playing that role, that was good enough for me. Does that make sense some more? Is that right? Miss Emba. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, is that your mom? 
Yes, <laughs> my mom, my mother, and my sister, they're on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Miss Amber. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, oh God, this is really great. So as we're getting um, closer, because we, we can keep going on about this for hours and days and days and days, um, as we get close, so this whole pathway of like planning, leaving space for God, understanding purpose, what would you say, um, wh what would be, how do I phrase it? The processing or the sequencing of preparing for life after grad school. I mean, not after grad school, after undergrad, after schooling, after a chapter mm -hmm. in our lives, getting ready for the next phase. How would you sequence in terms of like, preparing and then in that preparation allowing space for God? Um, there's going to be a lot of compartmentalizing um, and, and, and luckily like I'm going through the process again preparing to get out of graduate school so I can speak to you from where I am now and from where I've been during undergrad. Um, there's a lot of compartmentalizing because you have to be aware that this season and this particular journey is about to come to an end. However, you are still in the right now moment. <laughs> You're still a student. You're still an undergrad. So compartmentalize. The things that you need to focus on right now, the things that you must focus on now, focus on them. Don't be so worried about what's coming that you lose your um that you lose your sense of work ethic for the right now responsibilities that you have because um i'm i've, I've seen that happen and i'm seeing that happen a little bit like people are so worried about what they're going to do at the graduate school that <laughs> one young lady she um her thesis was due on that friday and she texted you know us on wednesday and was like i haven't started my thesis and I was like, girl, an 80 page thesis paper, you ain't started. <laughs> but you out here, um, you know, starting web series and whatnot. Okay. <laughs> but that's just, you know, so focused on what to do next that you're not, you know, handling business now. Don't be that person. Um, so compartmentalize. Um, another thing is if you have a prayer life, you believe in prayer, um, begin to make the visions that you have for your career a part of your prayer language. And what I mean by that is don't only write it down and say, okay, I hope this happens one day, or don't only go to God and, and cry about not seeing it manifest, but begin to decree and declare those things. If you see yourself as a producer, you need to start adding that to your prayer language that I'm going to be a producer. If you see yourself as an Oscar winning actress, you need to add that to your prayer language. I decree and declare I'm going to be an Oscar winning actress. Whatever it is you see for yourself in the future, add it to your prayer language now. Add it to your declarations and daily affirmations now. Because words have power. We have the ability to speak life or death. So you speak enough life and something's got to pop. <laughs> Something's got to pop. Um, I've seen it happen so many times for other people and I've definitely experienced it happening for me. That's another thing. And then number two, begin to put your attention. This is one thing that Queen Ava DuVernay said and I hold on to it for day life. And I'm gonna just, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm gonna um, give y'all a little, a little something, something. I requoted this on Instagram one day and she shared it. So I was like, oh, Ava's my sis. Like we're, we're best friends at this point. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, she said, put your attention on your intention every day. So if you are a person who you know you wanna produce films when you get out of Friends University, you can't afford to wake up at 12 o'clock noon because producers don't wake up at noon. If you know you are a person who wants to be an award-winning actress, you can't afford 
to go out all times of night and hang out and, and, and get sloppy drunk or, you know, whatever it is college kids are doing, you can't afford to do that. You got to miss that party. Why? Because you got to start training your body to be able to handle 14, 16 hour shoots. If you are a person who wants to write a book, stop writing like you text. Start learning how to use punctuation correctly. Whatever it is that you see yourself doing in the future, start speaking it and start practicing it. I see myself as a producer. I see myself as a writer. I'm not waiting for somebody to come knock on my door and say, hey, Deja, will you write for me? Will you produce for me? Absolutely not. I'm producing now on my level. I'm writing now on my level. And every time I do it, I just get better and better. Why? Because it's about the process. Don't be so focused on getting the opportunity that when it comes, you're not even ready because you haven't been practicing for it. You haven't been preparing for it. Especially with social media, we get so caught up in the numbers. Who's liking? Who's sharing? Who's commenting? We get so focused on the people that when the people come, we don't have nothing for them to see because we ain't been building nothing. You just been one, you just been peeking out the window. When they gonna come? When they gonna come? <laughs> and then they get there and you got nothing. Whatever it is you see yourself doing in the future. I'm gonna say it three times because that's biblical. <laughs> Whatever you see yourself doing in the future, speak it now, practice it now. Whew. I hope y'all got that, yeah? I really do. I hope y'all got all of that. Oh my gosh, thank you. Um, thank you so much. That's, whew, that's really good. <laughs> that is really good, that is really good. Um, I want to take this moment and um, open the floor up while we have about six minutes left. Oh, goodness. <laughs> time. I know. I, you know, I kept rambling because I was like, I'm loving this. I'm loving this. I'm loving this. And then In I'll true Deja and Sheldon fashion, exactly. y'all, we get on the phone and we can literally stay on the phone for three or four hours. <laughs> it's horrible. Pray for us. <laughs> So um, I'd like to open the floor up to any specific questions that you would like to, um, that you would, you have for Deja. Um, you can feel free to pop it into the chat and we can read it out loud. Um, if you don't want it to be a public thing, you can private message me and I can read it. I won't say your name. Um, or you just want to take the audio off and ask. Mm -hmm. Hi, yeah, I'm going to ask something. I'm Mariel, by the way. Hi. Hey. Um, so, I mean, you really touched on a lot of what I was already feeling and processing just now about like practicing what you want to do in the future now. But I wanted to just ask you if you had anything else to add to that for me, kind of where I am specifically. So I've been out of my undergrad for a few years now. I've had to postpone graduate school for like several times like I was admitted and then I couldn't go because of life circumstances mm -hmm. and I am just in like such a weird like this weird waiting phase but then also I'm like wow I really need to just like focus I just loved what you said about like focusing on now like mm -hmm. what can I do now to prepare but just anything you had to like add to that for this I don't know does that make sense mm -hmm. So you're not currently in school, Mario? No. You're not. So no. you're waiting to go back to school. You're waiting to go to graduate school? Yes. Or if God has other plans, be open to that and just go into performing. Or okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Are there, are there um, uh, community theater uh, companies around, regional there theater? Are, yeah. It's, it's just been weird because of the pandemic. Mainly. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what are your hobbies? What do you like to do? What are you oh, interested in? Uh, everything. <laughs> but I, I mean, I love singing. I love dancing. Mm -hmm. I have a lot more experience in that than I do acting, but I still love acting. And like mm -hmm. comedy is just so interesting and entertaining to me. But I love 
like connection with people like that is my yeah. I love that I love so that. the way that we are connecting now is through social media the way we are connecting now is through the internet yeah. so get on the internet and create something where you have a platform to sing dance and act um i used to do this thing called monologue mondays i don't do it anymore and i'm probably never gonna do it again <laughs> No. <laughs> that's hurting Sheldon I'm probably never gonna do it again so you could you could take the name and do it um, <laughs> but you could do monologue Mondays you could do music Mondays where you sing a, a Broadway show song you know you could sing right. or you can get online and take a dance number from a Broadway show that people might like and break it down for them and teach them how to do it put it on YouTube once you hit 1000 followers you can monetize it you know there are so many different ways for you to continue doing what it is you love to do without being physically in a theatrical space um so does that does that make that clear for you yeah. because then then you are building yourself as not only um an artist who's waiting on the world to open back up post covid but now you have started establishing yourself as a brand now you have started establishing yourself as a business you know and so you're going to be even more marketable when it's time for those grad programs to look at you when it's time for those theater companies to consider casting you sure. yeah. yeah thank you so much no problem love anybody anybody <laughs> like i saw your eyeballs like roaming my eyeballs are like moving to anybody yeah. oh yeah i was like looking around oh that was good observation sheldon <laughs> hey it's what I do, body language. I keep acting, yeah? <laughs> okay. We must have preached real good. Nobody got questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, as we're, if, as we're drawing closer um, to the end, <laughs> the end time of the Zoom, not the end times, um, I am going to uh, drop your website into the chat. Yes. And people can go there to find all of the m multiple ways to contact you. Um, mm -hmm. Hold on. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> um, to, um, to find you and to, um, to contact you. Mm -hmm. um, First off, let's all give um, a round of applause virtually, physically, for um, Deja M. Rice for taking the time to come and, um, and minister and um, really speak to us. Um, I, I guess um, my question, my closing question before we all depart um, is how do you set yourself up to hear what God's purpose is for you? Mm. Um. I know that's a big one to kind of go out on, but it was like- It is, yeah. but I can tell you how I do. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we're back to making room. Um, you can hear God through his word. That's number one. <laughs> um, God speaks through his word, but also you can hear God speak through your one-on-one -on -one communication with him um when you have silenced the crowds when you have silenced your friends when you have silenced everybody else and you get in one place with him just you and him and you get to really really pour out to him what's on your heart and then receive from him however he speaks to you what he wants to how he wants to respond but i will also say this hearing god works the same way as receiving god you have to make room for him so you're not gonna hear god if you have things that are contrary to his voice in your ear as well 
So I will say, guard your gates. What do I mean by your gates? I mean your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your spirit. Guard those gates. Make sure that nothing or no one that sounds contrary or that presents themselves contrary to the word of God is influencing you. Because my apostle always says, my spiritual father, he always says, whoever has your ear has your destiny. So make sure that you are protecting those gates, that you make sure that you are feeding yourself with the things of God so that when it is time to hear him, you can recognize and be able to differentiate between whether it's his voice, the voice of the enemy, or your voice. Because you sound kind of like God. <laughs> And it's the difference between being right and almost right. But you will know the difference if you spent enough time feeding yourself with his authentic word. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> oh, gosh, no, that's that's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, this is the part. So this is our final closing event of the First ever Black Artist Series here at Friends. I, uh, close the, I close the thing out. Yeah. Come on, headliner. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Come on. I closed it out. Yes, okay. you did. And we and we appreciate it so Come on, much. God. <laughs> yeah. Um, like always, it's a it's a pleasure to hear from you, Deja. I think you've ministered to a lot of people today, and I think as you said, you even, even encourage yourself through telling your testimony. Of course, we overcome by the blood of the lamb, by the words of our testimony. Listen, okay. come on, okay. here. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. I'm not gonna hold anybody any longer because I'll keep, we'll, Deja and I, we will restart the conversation again at this point. Have y'all here all day. Y'all follow me on social media. Yeah. Um, follow me on social media, I will follow back. <laughs> she's not one of those people that's like, oh, thank you for the follow. I have more numbers. No, she'll follow back. Yeah, um, no, I'm, 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 I'm not all that. Just, <laughs> just, just follow me. I'll follow you back. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, awesome. I'm gonna post that into the chat. I'll give a peop give the people, um, yep, there we go. Some time to um, get that in. But yeah, we are finished and done here. Thank you guys so, so much.